So, uh, hey everybody, my name's Anthony. Um, this week, this workshop is going to be about Markov chains. Let me kick this off because I can't even hear how loud my own voice is. Um, and title of the slide, Markov chains or how to create fake Wikipedia articles about dinosaurs. So a little bit about me. I'm a senior CS major here at UCF. Obviously, I'm an officer with AI at UCF. I've been so for the past year and I've done some research here at the school in evolutionary computation, generative storytelling and bioinformatics. Um, so if you want to talk research, please head over to the AI Discord or ping me in the Markov chain uh, channel in the Nighthacks Discord. If you have any questions about undergrad research, I'm more than happy to help and answer and guide you guys along those paths. And you can also use those same Discord channels to ask questions after this video is over. Or if you're watching a recording of this, you can ping me on those Discord channels too, in case you have any questions and you weren't here to ask. So we're going to briefly cover the agenda today. So I see a lot of chat pinging up. I'm not going to be checking chat too much while this is happening. When we take breaks to install something or I'm waiting for you guys, I'll go ahead and look at chat and see if there's any questions I can ask during those pauses, answer during those pauses. But here's the agenda. I'm going to show you guys how to install Python and how to clone the repo. I'm going to give you an overview of what are sequences, what is time series, and what exactly Markov chains are doing. And then we're going to give, like, why do we care about this, these types of problems? And then we're going to go through Markov chains. So before we actually introduce Markov chains, we're going to introduce the problem space that they encompass and that they solve. So we're just going to need to install two things for this workshop. We're going to need to install Python. So if you don't have Python already, if you use a Mac or if you use Linux, Python 3 might come pre-installed. Uh, you might know that already, but if not, you can quickly check on your machine if you open up a command line. And if you just type Python 3 version, dash dash version. So, but if you don't know if you have Python installed or not, it's really easy to install. And at least on Windows, uh, I don't use Linux. So Windows game right here, you just go ahead and you go to python.org, you go to downloads and you just install it like anything else. So before we move forward, I am gonna take a brief pause here and go ahead and look at chat. And also if you don't have Python already, this is, the time to install it. So, yep. And then we'll kind of move on just so everyone can get it installed. If y'all can help each other out, you can also use REPL. That is true. Um, if you want to follow the code exactly, if you want to clone the repo, you can't really use REPL. You kind of can actually. And I'll show you how to do that. And if people don't know what I'm talking about, there is something called REPL it and it lets you use code right in your browser. So you can do this. You can actually technically, I just saw right here, this is going a little bit off, but you can import from GitHub. I'm not too familiar with REPL, but if somebody knows how to use it and this is what they want to do, go ahead. Um, but yeah, if you don't have Python installed on your computer or if you use a Chromebook, you can't really install it, uh, you can use something like this instead. So, the second thing we're going to need is we're going to need Git. Uh, I know there was a Git workshop last week with the club. If you don't know what Git is, I'm more than happy to answer those questions in the chat in just a second. But if you don't know if you have Git installed, uh, you can just head on over here on Windows. Just go to the Git website, which is git-scm.com. And then you install it like anything else. So, and I'm going to go ahead and this is really, can I move this? I could. Perfect. So I'm going to go ahead and drop the link to the workshop in the chat. So, and I'm going to drop the link to Git as well for people who don't have it. Thank you, Chris. Chris actually sent the command that you're going to want to use in your terminal. So if you open up, let's do this. So if I, oh, that's not a real command on this. So I'm here, I opened up my command line. You don't need to put that dot git at the end, Robert. It's perfectly okay if you don't. Um, so if you just go wherever you want to put in the code. So let's see, I want to do it on my desktop. I just go ahead, git clone, and then I copy paste the repo link. Oh, I don't care. So you don't need to put it. Not get in the end, but it's actually good practice. Yeah, you don't need to do it. 
Um, there's lots of ways to clone into a repo. Git should be smart enough these days to just do it like that. Um, so git clone, and then you can open it. You're also going to need a text editor. If you don't have one of those, VS Code is the most popular one. And you can get it at VS Code. So we're going to wait a bit just so everybody here can kind of get everything installed and get the code downloaded and everything. You don't need the code downloaded to follow along with the workshop. I am going to be sharing my screen for the entire thing, but in case you want to look at the code while looking at the workshop open while the slides are open. Uh, I'll give everybody time right here to do that because I know I can talk a bit fast. So don't worry, we're not going to speed on through. You'll have time to ask questions and follow along. So is anyone here still having trouble with their setup, their Python or Git setup? And for people who are more advanced, Git is a second language to them already. Uh, you can go ahead and start looking at the workshop code itself. And I'll actually share the link to the slides because I forgot to upload them to the repo. So that way people who might be more advanced can still get ahead. There we go there. Yes, so you, you a text editor or an IDE. Um, Markavify, thank you, Nicholas, for actually catching that. Um, Markavify, so I was going to cover that in just a bit when we get to the code, but <laughs> um, you don't need that to run the code. But yeah, so what Nick is talking about is some of the modules we'll be using. So some of the some things about the workshop, we're going to write a Markov chain from scratch, and then we're going to use a third party module or library called Markavify, which is what you would actually want to use in production. But this workshop, we'll write it from scratch and then we'll show an example using an actual library if you wanted to use this in a project, let's say at Nighthacks or something like that. So one big thing, it is Python 3. Uh, the code won't work with Python 2 or 2.7. I think you are going to need 3.5 or higher. Like we said earlier, if you don't know how to check that, you can just type Python dash dash version. So, and if all of this is kind of confusing, you're like, hey, Anthony, I don't know Python. I don't know what's going on. That's perfectly okay. When we go through the Python code, I'm going to kind of walk you through it. We're going to write comments along the way. So that's okay if you don't know Python. It reads like pseudocode. Um, Nicholas, so you have pip install Wikipedia. And yeah, because that those are just modules I use to scrape the data and everything and I'll kind of show the data collection code afterwards in case anybody was curious, but you don't need that code to run anything here. So yeah. If no one has any troubles installing anything at the moment, I'm going to go ahead and move forward with the workshop. We're going to jump into the actual stuff. So if you have any troubles installing stuff, just go ahead, write in the chat. I'm sure someone else can definitely help. And if there's no stupid questions, if you have something, <laughs> so if you have trouble with something, please go ahead and ask, even if it's something as simple as installing Python, you know, we all started from somewhere where we had no idea where to start or how to do anything. So let's go ahead. So, so so before we can even introduce Markov chains, we need to introduce something called sequences. And sequences is quite literally as simple as it sounds. A sequence is just a pattern. It doesn't have to be something that repeats normally it is, but it's just a pattern or a sequence of events. So sequences, like as the slide says, are a set of events that follow some sort of order, but they can also be completely random. Um, this you're more often going to hear this call this time series data. So if some of you are more familiar, you might have heard of time series, neural networks, the fancy words like that as you browse the internet. That's basically what a sequence is. The two terms are interchangeable. So examples are going to include weather, the stock market, language, cooking. So a recipe is a sequence of steps, the life cycle of an organism. You are born, you go into adolescence, la, 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 and then you pass very suddenly. Sorry for getting existential here. We'll jump right into the next slide so you don't remember any of that. So one thing we want to know about sequences is one, why they're kind of useful is if we know how, like a series of patterns, 
can we know what the next pattern is before it happens? So I have some really, I think, good examples up here on the slides. But if we were a meteorologist and we wanted to know when it rained, uh, we might start looking for patterns in the skies. Oh, it rains before whenever there's dark clouds in the sky, stuff like that. Um, if you're a high frequency trading firm, you want to make sure you get the best gains on your stocks. So whenever a company announces a new product, you notice, oh, the stocks go up. Uh, and then you can decide whether to buy or sell uh, before those happens. So NVIDIA just announced new graphics cards not too long ago. So I'm sure some of you might have bought NVIDIA stock before the announcement of the graphics card, or you might have sold your NVIDIA stock after the graphics card were announced, things like that. Um, another one is invasive species. This might be someone like, huh? How do invasive species figure into this? Well, population dynamics is a sequence of events. So if whenever something is introduced to a population, so this is some bio stuff I didn't think you actually probably be getting here. So whenever we introduce something to an environment, like a lizard, like the Cuban anole, I think is a very invasive lizard, that it's probably the lizard you see whenever you go walking outside here in Florida. Um, it hurts the species of native lizards. So things like that can be modeled as a sequence. So language itself is a sequence. So the sentences that I make, the words that you see on the screen, they can be predicted, like what's the next word that's going to follow Anthony, and then most likely going to say Evia, so, which is my last name, in case you didn't understand what I was saying. So, what, like, you might have already kind of guessed, as the examples I gave, like, what problems are sequences going to solve? Like, weather forecasting. <laughs> if you want to know the weather tomorrow, what, do I bring an umbrella if I go outside? Chances are you're not going outside these days, but I hope you get what I mean. I hope you still remember what it was like to leave the house. Um, climate modeling, deeply important. We need to know the future to see how we're going to fix it or how we can mitigate the damage that human carbon emissions cause. Um, and more sinisterly, I also included some sinister ones, advertising. How are we going to get people to click something? So this might be unintuitive, but advertising is a sequence. If we show an ad like to this X population of people, how, how can we predict how many people are going to click that ad? Um, and social media, also a kind of unintuitive one. You might not think of this as a sequence, but as you use the app, Twitter, Instagram, um, the actions you take on an app are events. So I opened up Instagram, I clicked someone's profile because it had a saucy controversial image and description, things like that. Um, these are things that big social media companies do keep track of. They do monitor because it's how they keep people on the app itself. So if you're a frequent user of Instagram, you might have remembered that it used to be chronological and it no longer is because Instagram found out that if they made the feed of recommendations and not chronological order, they found that people stayed on the app longer, which meant more ad revenue and things along those lines. So we're going to take a quick little break, talked a lot. If anyone has any questions about sequences or is still a little confused, now's a good time to drop those questions in the chat. More than happy to answer them. It's also an excuse for me to drink water, which I'm running painfully low on. A bit worried about that. Hmm. So we're going to don't see any questions. So we're going to jump to the next slide. So now that I kind of covered what sequences are, there's a lot of ways to solve sequences in computer science. Like there's just entire fields dedicated to solving time series data. You can get a PhD in like weather forecasting specifically, like weather forecasting, just a region of the rainforest. That can be your entire PhD thesis. So it's very broad. We're going to cover a very narrow aspect of that today. Um, I just noticed that my silhouette has gotten darker. So I'm just like a dark shadow kind of giving you slide information. Very sorry about that. My lighting is like above here right now. Um, so very sorry that you just see a dark shadow giving you a lecture. <sighs> but Markov chains are one of the ways to solve problems of sequences, to solve how we're going to predict the weather the next day, how we're going to get somebody to click on the, the ad that we present to them, how we're going to keep someone on a social media app. So go back, let's go back to the weather example. If every like hour we record the weather and that's the event. 
So I look outside, the, it's dark clouds, that's an event. I check an hour from now, it's raining. So we can look at a slide here. The E can be the dark clouds. And then you see the 0 0.7 right here. Does anyone want to, in the chat want to tell me what that 0 0.7 is? So before I even give you it away, I kind of give it away on the slide, but the GPA, that's a good one. <laughs> Um, that's the best answer, actually. I think I'm going to have to cancel this workshop. Um, the 0 0.7, everyone is right. It is the probability, the chance of, trans Owen put it very nicely, the chance from transitioning to E to A. And this is basic, this is all of Markov chains. That's it. You learned it. Markov chains, all they do is store the chance of probab like probability from going to one event to the next. That's it. There's nothing like you hear Markov chains, you're like, oh my God, that's a really scary name, Markov. Chains, you never use the word chains in everyday language. Like these are two words you never use, um, but they're really simple. The actual Markov chain we're writing from scratch, I think is less than, you could do it in like 50 lines of code, which if you're new to programming, that sounds like a lot, but I promise you, you will write hundreds of lines of code for a single class, uh, especially if you're in CS1 or 2 at Wizz and Wineski. So that is a very trivial amount of code and Markov chains are a very trivial way to introduce people to these types of problems. Um, they're actually a quick aside, but Markov chains are really popular in the generative art community or like the computer art community. And a lot of these people are not computer scientists. They're not like programmers by trade. They're just an artist who wants to make art with computers and Markov chains is the really popular way to do that. So it's really very intuitive to understand and if you're still struggling to understand what they are, that's okay, that's perfectly fine. I didn't pick it up right away either. So we'll hopefully the next slides kind of explain what it is to you in more intuitive sense. But just to recap, all Markov chains are is a way of capturing what is the probability from one event going to the next event. So, so I'm going to quickly cover some applications of Markov chains. So if you use an iPhone, um, I don't know if this is true for Android, but if you use an iPhone, you open it up right now, you open up messages and you type, start typing something, those little three suggestions that it gives you, that's a Markov chain. Um, I don't think it is anymore, or it still might be because the suggestions are really bad. Um, so it still might be a Markov chain, but the predictive keyboard is still a Markov chain. Google's original, the thing that made them billions of dollars and the, <laughs> skip this Markov chain. the thing that made them the company they are today, it started with a Markov chain because back then Markov chains used to be really cutting edge and advanced. Um, so early versions of Siri and Alexa use what's called a hidden Markov model, which is like a more advanced version of Markov chain. Um, if you're in the natural language processing class, you were actually, we just covered that in lecture, but so Markov chains can pretty prevalent. Um, and some quick history from Markov chains, they were developed by a mathematician known as Andrei Markov. That's where the name comes from. So also population dynamics like the green and LA example I gave earlier. So um, Minji, I hope I pronounced your name right. If you scroll up in the chat, you should still see the links, but hopefully someone can give you the links earlier uh, where we just need Python and the and you actually have yeah, the slides show you what to do early. So, uh, Chappy says, the slides show you what to do earlier, so don't feel free. And I'm sorry for anyone who's annoyed that I'm looking at chat. I just want to make sure everyone's following along here and no one gets super left behind. So, how do Markov chains work? I just told you they're really simple. They're just the probability of going from one event to the next. And what exactly are we going to cover? What are sort of some of the examples? Um, the workshop is going to focus exclusively on language and text for Markov chains and some interesting things you might want to do to kind of solidify your understanding is maybe use Markov chains on weather. So you can go to a weather website, scrape the data for the weather in your area, and then use it, use the code that we're going to show here to predict what the weather is going to be tomorrow. Probably won't be too accurate, but you can give it a shot. But Let's go ahead, jump into it. We're going to be using Markov chains for language, and we're going to start with a very trivial example. Right up here, consider the sentences. I love to eat pizza. I like to eat porridge. That's disgusting. And I like to eat pancakes. So 
just we can think of you know if we go back to the earlier example of dark clouds and then it's going to be rain so there's 0.7 percent there's a 70 percent chance of there being rain if i see dark clouds inside if and this is going to be hopefully some people can get this question we're going to view the markov chain it's going to model these sentences so each word is going to be an event on the markov chain just like we saw earlier each word is a little circle an event and each line is the probability of going from one word to the next. So if I'm on word I, can someone here write, what is the probability of going to love? So I'm on I, there's three sentences, and there's two possibilities. I, from I, I can go to love or I can go to like. One third, everyone's spamming the chat. Yes, thank you. <laughs> Y'all got it. I like the person, thank you, Victoria, for giving the exact decimal percentage. <laughs> thank you. So you guys are nailing it already. So the probably, if you don't see this, I'm gonna go ahead and show a visual example. So if you're not getting it right away, you're like, am I dumb? You're not dumb, don't worry. We're gonna show a visual example in just a second. So one easy, really easy way to figure this out is just to loop over the sentences. So we start with, we have two for loops. So we have, this is an array, if you're familiar with that from programming, uh, from intro to C, this is an array. And if you should have learned this in intro to C or in CS1, and if you're not in CS1 yet, that's okay. But a string is just an array of letters. So we have an array, which is these three sentences, and in each sentence themselves, themselves is an array. So that'll make more sense when I show the code, but if you haven't learned that yet in your intro to C class, that's perfectly fine. So we can use a for loop to just loop over everything. And if we're at position I, we need to guess the probability of what comes next. More importantly, we need to keep track of that probability. So it's really simple. Um, I'm gonna cover what this data structure is in just a second. I'm keeping it ominous um, because there might be some people who are unfamiliar with this data structure yet, but if you're looking at the code, you already know what it is. Um, but it's literally just like you all saw already and we're able to tell if we're at position I, which is zero, the next word is going to be love for this first sentence. And if we're on this sentence, it's like blah, blah, blah. So we're just going to repeat that process for every single sentence. And for the bigger data set, we repeat it for the bigger data set. So we're going to be jumping into code in just a second. So I know if some people are itching to get into code, they don't want to keep looking at slides, totally get it. So for every sentence and sentences, just like I mentioned earlier, for every word in the sentence, we're gonna use our mysterious data structure. We're gonna keep track of the current word and we're gonna add what is the next word that follows that current word. So here are the questions. Um, for people familiar with Python, you can, you'll know the answer to this if you can read the syntax, but for people unfamiliar with Python, what do you think this data structure is? Just so I can kind of gauge the room of how many people might know the answer and if we're going to do a deep dive into what this is. And it's not that scary if you're in CS2 or you already took CS1, you already, you already know what this data structure is. So it is adding to an array. Yes, it is adding to an array, but this mysterious data structure is holding an array. So linked list is a, is a good, good example, good guess. It's not one of those. So. How many people here are familiar with hash tables, dictionaries? Yep. Pointers is techni technically it is a pointer. <laughs> so technically it is if you go to the low level C code above Python. Um, but it is a dictionary. Thank you very much, Owen. It is a dictionary. Um, and for people who are in CS1 and 2, uh, can you tell me what the runtime of this is? So the runtime of every sentence in sentences and for every word in sentences. So this should be pretty good runtime practice. So we're not going to count the runtime of this, which is O of 1. O of, yep, Reese got it. It's, oh, it is O of 1. So Python is O of 1 to do this operation right here. I wanted to know the runtime of the, lo uh, the loops, but Reese got the answer there. Well, actually, technically, it's n times n. It's not O of n squared. My bad. I misread that. The runtime is n times like k. And if you need to, if you need me to explain that later, I'm more than happy to, but I don't want to, you know, leave people behind who might not be, who might be unfamiliar with big O notation and runtimes. So the last question before we jump into the code, why do we have to go through each word in the sentence? So why is it important?
that if we have all these sentences, why do we have to visit each word and find the probability of the next word? Or pen what the next word is. Yep, it's really that simple. If we don't keep track of everything, our probabilities are not going to fully represent everything. Um, it's kind of a trick question. There's not really a complex answer to that. Uh, just quickly before I jump into the code, for the people who might have been confused, like, okay, why is that one third? So it's literally just a simple, there's three words that follow I. There's love, like, and like. So it's just like appears two out of three times, love appears one of the three times. And it's, it's, you follow the same process. If you're like, I don't know how to code this graph up in Python or in C or whatever language I'm familiar with using, that's okay. I'm gonna show you right now in the code. So let's jump right into that. Excuse me. So there's anyone who needs quick help downloading everything or are we all good? And if you don't want to download and you can just follow along, it's perfectly fine. But we can do a quick aside here. If I don't see anything in the chat, I'm going to assume everyone is good. So can't figure out how to open the code. No problem. So I'm going to, so you need a text editor. We, so you do have to download Git if you want to get the code. So I'm actually going to run through an example right that, that right now. For people who are more advanced, I am sorry. But, you know, we want to make sure no one is left behind. I hope you can just be patient for a brief second as we kind of show everything. So VS Code is perfect. I'm using VS Code. I think it's the best text editor. I use it over my IDE like 99% of the time. So VS Code is perfect. So if you want to get the code, you just need to download Git. You can download Git for Windows. You need to make sure you have Python installed as well. There's instructions a little bit at the beginning of the slides. And you need to go to this link, which I'll share again. And all you have to do in your terminal is type git clone. And you need to go where you are need to be right now. Git clone. If you don't know how to open your terminal, or if you're like wondering what I'm using, like why my terminal has tabs, like if you're on Windows, you might be used to command prompt that looks like this. It's really, it's really ugly. Um, what I'm using is called Windows Terminal. And it, it is great. So you should definitely get Windows Terminal. Um, it's very nice. You don't have to get it for this. You don't have to get it for this. I'll definitely get it afterwards. Uh, if you do develop on Windows, it makes developing a lot easier because it gives you tabs. That's literally the benefit of it. Um, but all it's literally all you have to do to get the code is just git clone and then git clone into the repo. And if you don't know what git is, there is a workshop that Night Hacks did last week. Uh, I'm sure they have a recording of it. I'm assuming they do. I'm not an officer with the club, so I don't know. I'm just friends with people in the club. So you can definitely reference that workshop to get a familiar with grit. So you're typing into your command, your terminal. So you're typing into your command line. You just all you do is typing git clone and then the link to the repo. You don't need to type Python or anything. So I'm going to send you all you have to do is copy paste that command, the whole thing, git clone into the wherever you want to download the code. And if you and then you can open up in VS Code and add something in VS Code, you can either add folder to workspace, you can open folder. And you just got to find where you saved it and open the folder up. And if you're wondering what this Azure video indexer is, ignore that. That was for a Night Hats workshop back in spring. I just kept all the code in within the same repo, but that is completely irrelevant to the workshop today. Everything you need is in the Markov chain, Markov workshop folder. So we're going to jump right into the code. Um, if you are, so if you're kind of overwhelmed, don't worry. I'm going to give a quick overview of what this all is. So. We have the Markov workshop folder. I'm assuming everyone can still see my screen. Can I get a thumbs up if y'all can still see my screen? Cool. I didn't want to sound crazy as I talked about this. So we have a data folder, and that just contains all the data for what we're going to be using. Um, so we are going to be, this, this is going to give you a hint of some of the examples, but Oprah and Shakespeare are involved in our examples. So then we have this file called data collection.py. This is not officially part of the workshop, 
This is just if anybody wants to know how I scraped Wikipedia, you can go ahead and look at this Python code. But this is not something I'm really going to cover today. Um, I'm more than happy to answer questions about it in the discords. So either AI at UCF discord or the night hacks discord. So um, I just wanted to include it. So in case people wanted to learn about how did you get all that dinosaur data, because it is approximately, if we look at it right here, process dino data, that's a lot. Uh, I'm still scrolling. Uh, it's like, yeah, a thousand, right under 1,400 summaries of dinosaurs. So, yep, and it's long. So, yep. So that's just there for your learning purposes. It's not there for the workshop. So, and this is just a quick aside on what dictionaries is. I'm going to get to this in a second. So if you don't know what a dictionary is, if you were confused by the mysterious data structure, um, we're going to cover that when we get to there. So. And then Markov, this is the Markov chain from scratch. And then this is Markov using Markovify, which is a third party library. Um, and what you should use if let's say you wanted to use Markov chain at my hacks, October 9th through October 11th, which you should register and sign up for. Uh, it's a great learning experience that you should definitely go to. So let's go ahead and jump into it. And then quick questions or quick asides as I have an excuse to drink water. Okay, so we're going to start from the top. Um, you can ignore what this is. This is just showing the like same example from the side. I typed the command. The command. Um, Minji, if you're still having trouble, it's okay. You don't need to download the repo to like follow along. So I'm going to run everything. Um, I'm more than happy to help after the workshop, and we can kind of figure out what's going into what's happening. So, or someone in the chat can help you. Some very friendly people there. So. Let's jump into it. We're, we're going to start with making our Markov chain. So before we can kind of use what the Markov chain is, um, and actually, I forgot to explain something. Um, I think you guys kind of intuited by the first title of the workshop, like Markov chains or how to make fake dinosaur Wikipedia summaries. But what we're using the Markov, Markov chains for our example today is we're going to generate text. So if that gave it away, we're going to generate text. So I hope I forgot to explain that explicitly. But I think that was, you could intuit that from everything. So we're going to start by creating our Markov chain. We're going to go line by line through the code. So if you're completely confused about what Python is, that's OK. Uh, it should read like pseudocode. So I'm going to assume that most people here who have never used Python before. So one of the things I do want to point out, uh, if you're familiar from a language like C, the way you declare your variables is int variable equal 1. In Python, you don't do that. You could just literally say variable, or you could do variable, and then you use a colon, and then the data type. So if you see this here, just so that doesn't trip you up. And that's, that's some people who use Python don't even know. So def means function. So this is just defining a function called create Markov chain. We take in our data, which I, how I mentioned earlier is a list of lists. So we have a list. And then each string is just a, a list of characters, also called an array in C. It's not explicitly called an array in Python, but they're the same thing. So what we're going to be returning is a dictionary, which I'll explain what it is later, and another list. And I haven't told you what this is yet, but don't worry about it. We're not we're going to ignore what beginnings is for now, because that's not technically part of the Markov chain. That's what we use to help us with generating. The type hints uh, actually enforced these days. Type hints are not enforced. So this is a question that if you don't know what Python, it's perfectly fine. But this is just called a type hint. Um, so I don't actually need to write this and my code will still work. I can delete that. The code will still work just fine. This just makes it easier for other people to read your code. So yep. So we're going to start. We're returning two things. So we're returning a dictionary and a list. And we, you see it down here. Python lets you return more than one thing at once. If you're used to other programming languages, it's not really a feature. It's being added more and more these days. But normally, it's you can only return one thing. You get around that by returning an array, like wrapping this in like brackets or something. But Python lets you return two things like this really easily. And then you can grab those later. And we'll show that. So let's jump right into it. So we start by instantiating our dictionary 
and our beginnings array. But I, like I said, I'm not going to talk about that. So don't worry about the beginnings array yet. It's magic. Um, so we're going to start the four sentence in our data. So this is our data right here, four sentence. Boom, boom, boom. We have three sentences. We're going to split the sentences up by words. So it makes it easier to loop over them with the next for loop. So what all this code does is sentence that split is all the spaces between them. It makes a separate array. We want to get the length, just like if you were getting the length in a normal for loop. So for I less than or equal to length. So we want to get the length. And then we're going to use a very specific Pythonic thing called enumerate. So if you're confused by the word Pythonic, that's just what people like people, the Python developers called writing very Pythonic code. So you're using a lot of features of the language to take advantage of that. Um, you can write a normal for loop here and your code will still work. So, so, but we're using Pythonic code. So I wanted to give good coding examples so people who are learning Python have a good example to step by. I think my code's good. It might be terrible. I don't know. Don't tell me if it is. Um, so all we're going to be doing is I. So if you're familiar with intro to C and for loops, I is just a number and then a word. And I think you could tell what the word is. It's just a word in the sentences. So for it, Actually, I'm not going to explain this yet, but at the, if we're at the zero, we append the beginnings. So if a word is not in our Markov chain yet, so that means we haven't seen this word yet, we're visiting it for the first time. So we would do that basically every time we go to a word at the beginning. So I hasn't been there yet, so we're going to add that to our Markov chain. And this is where I'm going to put a quick aside, and I'm going to explain what a dictionary is. And if you already know what a dictionary is, good. So, that means you're probably in CS2. Um, if you don't know what a dictionary is, but you know what a hash table is or a hash map, they're the exact same thing. So don't worry. You don't, <laughs> they're the exact same thing. Python just calls them something else. But all a dictionary is, is a dictionary, like quite literally a dictionary. I have a little appendix here. It's a dictionary. So like you open up your favorite dictionary. I wish I had one right here to like give a prop, for example. I'm just gonna use a book. You open up your Merriam-Webster's dictionary. Let's say I want to know the definition for dimensionality. So that's what the word that pulled up here. I want to know the definition. I have the word I'm looking for, and I get the definition. That's all it really is in practice. And in code, it looks, lets us do really cool things. So let's say I want to know, this is my dictionary. So the things on the left right here are the words I'm looking up. I know 400 isn't a word, but walk through the example right here, suspend disbelief. And then the things on the right on the definitions for those words. So if I'm looking at the word Marco, the definition is gonna be polo. And what makes dictionaries a little more confusing is you access things in a dictionary using this array syntax. So if you don't know what I mean by array syntax, if I had a list, so zero, one, two, three, I can do, it's kind of the exact same syntax. So I use these brackets to get the zeroth item in that array. So dictionaries, it's the exact same thing. I'm in my first dictionary and I look up Marco. And for people who are new to Python, so if you already know about Python, don't say anything. But for people who are new to Python, what is, if I go Marco, what is that going to print? So I type Marco in, I'm going to run this code before I do Polo, exactly. I hope, I really hope that kind of cements what exactly is going on. I know that might just like a dictionary, that sounds really complicated. They're not, they're quite literally like just think of an actual dictionary. You have the word you're looking up and then you have the definition. Um, more often it's called key value pairs or key and data. Uh, are we, are we just good cut out? Yeah, I think okay. it throws up a little. So what's on the left is the key. And what's there. on the right? Oh, um, can you, you go back like 30 seconds, please? You froze. Yes. Yeah, you're good. You mentioned key Thank value you. pair and then. Thanks for catching that, y'all. I don't know what happened. We were all very much in suspense. Oh, okay. There's nothing, there was nothing special hidden after that. So I left off a key value pair as I was told. Um, dictionaries were like, 
you'll often hear dictionaries or hash maps or whatever fancy word you want to call it. Um, the data is stored in a key value pair. You can quite think of it like if you go back to algebra, and I'm so sorry for bringing back these old memories, but like f of x. So f of x, and then that's going to be whatever the thing is. I actually don't remember math. It's been so long since I've taken it. Um, but quite literally a dictionary. So f of Marco equals polo. So that's another analogy I can use on what exactly a dictionary is. Um, it's defined by these brackets. I think I was calling these brackets earlier. I don't actually know the difference. Between, yeah, these are square brackets. That's what they're called. Um, so the thing with dictionaries is the data on the left can be different. So we have a 400 here, a Marco and Rice. That's the same thing as Marco. They're both strings. But the data on the right can be different. So I can just put, I can put a number, or I could put a floating point. I can put anything I want in these dictionaries. One thing that you can't do, and this is not going to really bug you guys, but you can't make a list as the string, as like the key. Uh, Python will let you do that. And there's like very specific reasons why you'll get an error that says, oh, it's not hashable or, or something like that. Um, if you take CS2, that, that's going to make a lot more sense. But for the sake of it, like you're not going to worry about that. But just in case if you're picking up Python after this workshop and you try to do something like that, uh, it's going to bite you in the behind. One of the workshops, so I gave an exercise. So I gave some exercises here to solidify what you learn. One of the exercises, you might make that mistake. So that's why I'm kind of telling you right now that you can't hash another list. Um, to answer that question, and, and Wilson, I'm sorry if I pronounced your name wrong. Um, you can you can hash it. There is a trick, but it's not. You can't just use the list itself. You can hash it though. There is you can treat it like an object. That is the right direction to take, but by default you can't. So I imagine by many people who are new to Python won't know that. So so yeah, this is all that a dictionary is. It's your Merriam-Webster's with Python. So we're going to go back here into our code where we left off on if our word is not in our Merriam-Webster yet or our markup chain, then what we're going to do is we're going to create an empty list, an empty array. So then we're going to, this is just some extra checks to make sure we don't go out of bounds. Um, if you want an actual fun exercise is prove this works, like try to get your head around the understanding. But basically, I actually, I'm going to give away the understanding. If we're at pancakes, we, there's nothing after pancakes. If we try accessing the next word, we're going to get a seg fault. We're going to get a memory error. It's going to crash. So that, that's literally all it is, is checking. Um, so yeah, this is literally similar from the slides. If we're at a current word, we want to add that to our list. And this is where you get that probability from, the 2 thirds for like and the 1 third for love. So that's it. So Markov chains are normally introduced with a lot of math. But the actual intuition behind them is zero math. Um, and if anyone here is currently in CS2 or has already taken CS2, markup chains are a graph. And this is one way to create a graph. So if you're familiar with graph data structures, there's two ways to create graphs. You can use a 2D array or you can use a hash map. And this is literally, that's it. You're, you just made a graph, quite literally. So if you're not familiar with graphs, that's OK. This is just some extra knowledge for the CS2 folks there. And if you want to run this code yourself, which I'm going to show you, you can see how the markup chain looks just by uncommenting that. And Python has comments like that, as you can tell. In other languages, it's two forward slashes. In Python, it's a hashtag. I don't know why, but there is your answer. So this is the code for generate creating the markup chain itself. And if anyone has any questions about the code, it's a list, are we just going to sort? I'm going to answer the question right now, I guess. Um, I don't see why you calculate a probability anywhere. That's a good question, Robert, um, because you don't need to. So the way it works, and I think it'll make more sense in generating text. Yeah, you're literally just storing it as a list. And for the purpose of like generation and generative art, you don't need to do any specific probability calculation. Yep, okay, we just randomly select it. Yep, so <laughs> you got it. Yep, we're just randomly selecting something from the, it says possibilities here. So Markov chain that seed, and I'm going to kind of explain what this is. I'm going to write some comments. So if this doesn't make any sense, that's okay. So 
we're jumping into our generate text function. So we just pass it the Markov chain we made. We pass it these beginnings list and how many times we want to generate for and how long do our generated sentences want to be. So if we wanted to be a few letters long, if we wanted to be X letters long, this is what we do here. If you see this little like underscore, um, all this is, if I type an I there, my IDE VS code is going to tell me unused variable I and the way, and like, that's like a code smell. Code smell is just like bad practice. Don't do that. Python, you could just do that and do a little underscore. And that tells other people who are reading your code, the variable there is not important. We don't need to worry about that. And if that doesn't make sense to you, that's okay. But this is just some things to clean up your code, make it easier for other people to read. So as you're reading other people's code, you're trying to figure out what's going on and you see a little underscore there. Um, don't be intimidated. Like, what are they doing? What black magic? Um, it's just underscore. It's just, we're not using that variable. So it's, we don't need to give it a name. So we start off our generations with iterations. So how many times are we going to generate something? Uh, we grab a random choice from beginnings. So this is where I explain beginnings. Literally all it does is the beginning of each data. We just type in I, cause that's how we're going to do generation. So one really fun example we're going to use is we're going to use a bunch of academic subjects. So a bunch of course names. So the beginnings is going to be the first word here. So literally the first word that appears, some of them are one word long, so it's not super helpful, but literally the first word that appears, that's going to be the beginning. And that's how we start the generation for the process. And if that's kind of doesn't make sense, it's a little confusing, you can kind of prove that self, prove that works, or I can explain in more detail after the workshop is over, um, because it's not really part of the Markov chain. This is just a hack I'm doing to make the code more readable. So this is not like fundamental Markov chain theory. This just makes your life easier and makes the code simpler to use. So we have a random seed, like in Minecraft, a seed for the world. Um, and if you don't play Minecraft, I'm sorry, that reference made no sense. So we're going to store our result, which is just, they're both strings. So these are both strings. So what I can do in Python, I can just type string like that to let you know that those are strings. So now we're going to generate it. So we have a bunch of possibilities. So just like we're at I, we have three possibilities. We go to our Markov chain, our seed is I, then we get, we're going to get this return. So now possibilities is equal to this array. Um, this check right here is how we know we're at the end of a sentence. If something check, something check. So if we're at pancakes or porridge, this is going to be empty. So that's how we know we reach the end and we don't want to get a null error and try to randomly select from an empty list. Um, so that's all this is checking for. Um, so then what we're going to do is after we get a random possibility, so the seed is going to be another random thing from that list. So we're going to randomly select from right here. And this is where the probabilities comes into play. If you're randomly pulling from a bag of like green and red balls, you and there's two green and one red, you're going to have a two third chance of getting the green. So that's literally all we're doing. We're randomly pulling from the bag and we're going to see what we pull out. The probabilities are calculated by this, like that. So we just append that, add that all together. Uh, we keep repeating this for a while and then we're going to print the result. Um, I think this is a good chance to explain, Anthony, where are the brackets for your for loops? If you're new to Python, you might not know that there are no brackets. So in other languages, I'm going to quickly pull up JavaScript here. Probably, I hope I don't confuse any more people, but you see these brackets that enclose your code. That is, that's in Python, you don't need those. And if you're wondering, why do I have pretty rainbow colors right here in my IDE? Um, that's called an extension called rainbow indent. So if you go to VS Code, and it makes reading Python code and working with Python code a lot easier, uh, indent rainbow. So it just adds rainbows here to make your code easier to read. So that's why I, I think there's also, yep, there's no semicolons either. Good catch, John. Yep, no semicolons in Python either. So so some people, that's a big detriment to others. It's a blessing. So this is how we're going to print our results. I've talked enough about this. We're going to jump into actually showing some examples. And then after we show some examples and people have chances to ask questions, um, we're going to show a quick code run through of an actual library, Markovify. This is something like I mentioned a million times over what you would actually want to use. So all out of water.
no excuses to pause now. So when I was, a quick aside, when I started this workshop, I wanted to do dinosaur Wikipedia summaries and I scraped, and I thought it'd be really fun. I thought it'd be really good. Um, and I think you know where this is going. It wasn't. The, the generation, I want to prime you. I know I've been talking about dinosaurs this whole time, but I'm priming you right now. When we see those examples, they're bad. But I was testing this. I was showing my, my girlfriend some of the examples, and she loved this one that I'm about to show, the one I'm going to lead off with. So I might lead off strong, or I might just show the dinosaur one first. I'm just going to lead off strong, and hopefully people enjoy what this is going to do. So if you're wondering what black magic I just pulled there, I just uncommented the code. Um, I used some keyboard shortcut. You, it's literally the same as just going line by line and doing that. But um, the keyboard shortcut I used was control KC. So that's how you can comment code in Python, control KC, and uncomment. And I know some people might be annoyed. Why are you explaining keyboard shortcuts? Because I know when I used to watch tutorials by people and they just kind of did things on the screen and I had no clue what was going on, it really bothered me. So that's what I'm trying to help you guys with. So we're going to load in a bunch of classes. So academic subjects, classes. Some of these classes are from UCF. So I spent some time manually adding classes from UCF because the UCF course catalog site is really hard to scrape. I wanted to scrape it, but yeah. Control plus, oh, thank you, Max. That's another keyboard shortcut you can use. I didn't know VS Code offered that one too. So there's another. So, and also you might see businesses and industries. That's literally just, I'm adding this in too, just because it seems similar enough. So I'm trying to make the code kind of wacky and fun. So you guys haven't seen the data before. You have no clue what it's going to generate. So let's go ahead and see, like, what, what is this Markov chain? Is it actually fun? So we're going to run the code. Hopefully we got some funny examples. So we generated five classes from our giant class data set. And if people are confused, let's go ahead and we can run through them. Um, these actually kind of make sense. Research methods in the Roman Empire. That sounds like it could be an actual history class. Um, alternative medicine. I don't like that that's a class. That's bad, especially these days. Um, public safety, teacher education, the performing arts and environment. That also sounds like a class. Outsourcing and offshoring. These are not funny. I'm going again. Um, radiation with matter analysis and jewelry. There we go. That's a little different. Um, none of these are good. And I'm sounding like a bad comic right now. So I'm going to keep going until I get some. Oh, there we go. We got some good stuff. So legal services administration of the particle systems analysis and safety technology and pastry. That's good. This is the type of stuff I see people laughing in the chat that validates these examples. Radiation biology of the Amazon, gold. Um, marine biology of special education, of special education of aerospace structures. I want to take that grad course. So these are the types of things you could do with Markov chain. Um, you can generate little funny snippets like this. You can also generate gibberish text. Um, and one of the best examples I want to show of Markov chains that I'm going to save till the end, I'm not showing you guys yet, is an absolutely hilarious story. Um, but so let's go ahead. So Abraham, um, I'm going to let me actually quickly cover that. So if you try running the code right now, so if you try doing Python 3 Markov chain, you're going to get errors saying uh, module not found, Wikipedia. And you might be confused, like, why is there Wikipedia in my code? So I use something called data collection. Um, this is how I got all the dinosaur data from Wikipedia. And I used a library called Wikipedia to download the data. So we'll do a quick Python aside right here. All you have to do to fix this, if you're on Windows, Rip. That's unfortunate. It, yeah. Oh. Never know what command you Windows and install Python 3 from the installer. Can you all hear me? Yeah, okay. So if you're in if you're on Windows, you can install Python 3 through the installer. Yes, okay. If you're if you installed Python 3 through the Windows installer, yep, I have rollback net code. I this is a Street Fighter game. Um so I, I actually don't know if Street Back has a Street Fighter has rollback net code. I just know that's a thing in fighting game communities. But anyways, um, if you install it this way, you can all you have to do to fix that error. Uh, I forgot who asked it already. 
So Abraham, all you have to do to fix that error is pip install Wikipedia. If you're on Mac or Linux, you might need to do pip three. So yes, Devin, that was a very good joke. That excellent comedic timing. Um, I know what it feels like to be the, the professor that gets frozen mid lecture now, because I have no clue that the freezing is happening. And like I connected a 15 foot ethernet cord to connect to give this workshop today. Um, but if you want to fix that error, just copy paste that command I posted in chat into your terminal. So all you got to do is pip install Wikipedia. And if you're on Linux or Mac, you have to do pip3, because that means Python 3, because Linux is really dumb and sometimes comes with two versions of Python installed. So if I do this, oh, I don't, I actually uninstalled Python 2, so this is a terrible example. But go ahead, kind of jump back into the code. So so yeah, if you're getting that error, that's because I used it here. Um, after this workshop, I think I'll upload it. I'll re-upload the code to GitHub, and I'll I'll make it that people don't get that error. Um, I didn't think of that when I was like uploading all the code just now in a flurry. So really sorry about that. So I'm sorry that you can't just instantly run the code and get it to work. So let's jump into the dinosaur Wikipedia summaries. The whole reason y'all came to the talk today, tonight. Um, so. I promise you, I, I really wanted this to work. So, and it's, you could try, I, it's not funny to read out loud what this is, um, but it, it makes something. And I bet some of you wouldn't even know it's fake. If you just kind of looked at that, like that's real. Yep, the Xenophorophorus, meaning Marini lizard, is a man of reputation dinosaur with its parents. You, you didn't even want to read after that. That reads like an actual Wikipedia entry, very dry and very to the fact about dinosaurs. Um, egg laying eggs. Um, thank you for pointing out the funny bits in here because this is too much for me to read live. And I don't think this is the type of entertainment y'all came for tonight or any entertainment at all for that matter. Um, I thought I had another, another funny gag with Oprah and Shakespeare. So this, we can quickly go through this data. Um, this is a bunch of Oprah, there's some Oprah quotes and then there's a bunch of Shakespeare quotes. So like I, I got this data from here um, and I'll show you guys where I got these data, data sets from. Um, so, so you're not wondering why does Anthony have a bunch of Oprah quotes saved to his hard drive? Um, I promise you I've never seen an episode of the show. I have no clue that she gave away a Mercedes last week to like five people in the audience. I didn't know that. Um, that was fake. Can you tell? I don't know. You're not gonna look it up. But anyways, let's go ahead and see what happens when we generate Oprah and Shakespeare. Oh no, I deleted the code. So go ahead and load that in. So Maya, if you're not getting any outputs, that's because the code is still commented. So I uploaded the code all commented out. So um, pip comes installed with your computer when you install Python. So yeah. If I, I'll run through, if anybody's having still technical troubles, I'll be more than happy to kind of run through one by one in the Discord afterwards or after when we get to question time. So, yeah. But I don't want to take too much time away from people who just come to watch the workshop. So, um, Python, so if we run the Oprah Shakespeare, I don't think it's that good. I thought it'd be really funny. I'm just sharing it because I had it written in the code, but I probably should have gotten rid of it. So there's the Oprah Shakespeare one. It's not that great, but it's just more examples of what the uh, Markov chain can do. So I'm gonna quickly go over Markovify. So we wrote a Markov chain from scratch. That's really cool. We have all this code and we could do a bunch of cool things with it. I really implore you after this workshop, maybe this weekend to go through the code and actually do some of the exercises I suggested. Um, maybe rewrite the code in your favorite language. So initially I was gonna do this workshop in JavaScript, but then I was told Python is more popular. I really like JavaScript, I also really like Python, um, but I thought people might be more familiar with JavaScript since it looks more like C. But if you're like, Anthony, I don't like Python, I have the code in JavaScript and it reads like C and it reads like Java. So if you wanna re-implement the code in Java, here's a great reference to start with. So. I was going to upload Rust code as well, uh, but I didn't get around to that. I still might do it this weekend. So if you want to see a Rust Markov chain, uh, please check back in by Sunday. Anyways, let's go through Markovify. So what is Markovify exactly? If I open up the browser, 
Markovify, it's just another library for a markup chain. And it's a really good library. It's something you would want to use if you're going to use this for a hackathon project, like I've said a million times before. Um, it's really simple to use. It has a bunch of neat features if you're trying to deploy it on like an API or a website. Um, it's really awesome. So Markov chain, we're going to use the Markov, uh, Markovify on the dinosaur example. So we're going to use the Markovify. And it actually comes out a little bit better, like very tad bit better. You can't really tell, like I know it did because I ran, like I ran a lot of examples of this before the workshop. So it comes out a little bit better. Um, as to the exact reason why, I didn't look into like the actual code from Markovify, like how they're doing their Markov chains, but they might do some optimizations to the math that I'm not doing. So if you wanna know a more additional math about Markov chains, the Markov chain Wikipedia page is really long, really extensive, you can kind of go through it. And see. Um, pseudo Python is perfectly safe for this code, Robert. So if you're running into permission errors with running Python, that's a separate Stack Overflow question you might want to look up. But you can run pseudo Python just fine. But none of this code has any malicious things in it. I promise. Obviously, if it did have malicious things in it, I wouldn't tell you. But um, you can kind of read the code for yourself here. It's, it's perfectly fine. But yeah. That's roughly everything. We kind of covered all of it. Um, I'm going to go over some quick smaller things. Um, so these are the references. So if you're like, Anthony, you are a terrible teacher. I want to know where you learned from. Um, check out the references. I gave references to everywhere I kind of reviewed before running this code. Um, yeah, don't get into the habit of running pseudopython. You're right, Robert. No, definitely don't do that. But if you want to go through the code, um, you want to go through the examples. I, there's a bunch of YouTube videos I learned from. Can y'all still hear me still? My headphones just cut out. Holy <laughs> said this. Cool. Yeah, there's a bunch of YouTube videos I learned from. There was one really awesome one by The Coding Train. Daniel Schiffman is an awesome YouTuber. Uh, I really compare him to Zemlansky levels of energy. So if any of you have taken Zemlansky before uh, and you want more Zemlansky in your life and you kind of miss him, then Mark, Daniel Schiffman is that same type of excited teaching and he runs his YouTube channel called The Coding Train and he goes over a Markov chain and he codes one from scratch with you guys. He does it all in JavaScript. So if you need more examples of Markov chains, definitely go check this out. Uh, and he has an awesome YouTube channel with a lot of fun stuff and a lot of creative coding uh, kind of mixed in there. So definitely a fun way to learn to code. Uh, and he has a really awesome book called The Nature of Code. So. Yeah, uh, I, I know it's quite the endorsement, Maya. I do strongly stand by this endorsement. Uh, Daniel, I actually read The Nature of Code long time ago before I even knew how to code. It made no sense, but I watched his video series on it. And that's how I first learned to code, was trying to follow a, a more advanced book on the topic. It didn't make me a good programmer, and I was stuck for years. Definitely don't do that. Um, but I do st strongly stand by that endorsement. But yeah. That's roughly everything here. We're going to cover some little last minute things like you learned about Markov chains. That's cool, Anthony, but what, what else did we do? Like, what next? Um, well, where to go next with Markov chains? Um, try making your own cool things with it. You can try making your own Twitter bot with it. There's a lot of fun Twitter bots that use Markov chains. Markov chains are actually fundamental to a lot of advanced research techniques right now, kind of ish advanced. Uh, if you're familiar with the field reinforcement learning, which is a kind of new cutting edge field of AI at the moment, it's the new hotness. It's been around for a long time, but it's getting a lot of press lately for things like uh, AlphaGo and AlphaZero and those Dota reinforcement learning agents that kind of beat everybody. Um, they use something called the Markov decision process, which the math is rooted in Markov chains. Um, and there's something called Monte Markov chain Monte Carlo methods, which is something else for reinforcement learning. So this is something that's actually going to be useful for like cutting edge research if you want to be into that field. So this is kind of fundamental stuff. Um, if you like the kind of generative, like the language stuff, um, ngram language models are basically Markov chains, which are like more advanced probability adjustments. So there's a little more math involved with them, but they are Markov chains at the bare level. Um, and if you're crazy, quantum Markov chains are a thing too. I'm not making that up. I really wish I was. But if I look up quantum Markov chain, Wikipedia is going to back me. I went to this link today because I'm like, that's not real. Um, they use quantum probability. So 
yeah, I don't know anything about quantum probability, but this is, this is a thing you could do too. If you really want to get into Markov chains, you can do that too. But that's roughly everything. I'm going to leave, uh, I told y'all, I'll leave you with a really funny example of a Markov chain. So there's this very fun little thing called Batman Loves Him a Criminal. If you've heard of this before, I'm quite surprised. Um, this is not like Batman erotica that I'm looking up live in a school thing, but it's a fake Batman entry for the Batman the Animated Series. Uh, and it was written using a Markov chain and a predictive text keyboard. Um, what exactly this person did, it's from like these, I think collection of artists called Botnik. So they have Botnik Studios. What they did is they made, you know how I mentioned earlier, uh, like the predictive text keyboard on your Siri device? They, you, they scraped all the synopses for Batman, Wikipedia, the animated series, and they made this. Uh, and it's a really funny read. Um, it's absolutely hilarious. And I love sharing this example. And you should definitely read it after this. I'm going to add this to the references of the repo. So somebody who stumbles along in the future gets a little treat. So I'm going to do that live. But if you have the time after this workshop, definitely read that little fun fake entry. And they've done a lot of other fun stuff with Markov chains, a lot of other humorous things. So yeah, um, that's roughly everything. That's the entire workshop. If you all have any questions, if you want me to go over something else, now is the time. Um, but yeah, that's everything. <laughs> Thank awesome. You, Thank you so much, Anthony.